Hospitals and health systems have always stood ready to respond to disasters and emergencies. Hurricanes, earthquakes, wildfires, floods, pandemics, you name it. But in the 21st century, the readiness mission has grown even more. Today's threats include new highly pathogenic strains of disease, cyber attacks on health systems, and chemical, biological, radiological, or nuclear weapons that could be used by terrorists or nation states. It's increasingly clear that neither private sector hospitals nor the federal government can prepare for every scenario by themselves. But joining forces helps a lot. Welcome to Advancing Health, a podcast from the American Hospital Association. I'm Tom Hederly, senior writer with AHA. September is National Preparedness Month, and today's Advancing Health podcast has the perfect guest to talk about what is being done and what is being planned for the mission of national readiness. Dr. Robert Cadlick is Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response, ASPR, at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. His office serves as the Secretary's principal advisor on matters related to public health emergencies, including bioterrorism. Dr. Kadlik, thank you so much for coming on Advancing Health today. It's a pleasure to have you here. Appreciate Tom, it. thank you. I'm really glad to be here, and um, it's a great honor to represent my department and our activity to you. So let's roll. So why don't we start at the beginning, and let me ask you, what is ASPR, and what is its role within the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services? The Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response was mandated by Congress after the uh, Hurricane Katrina, where it was recognized that, quite frankly, there was really no one in charge of managing the health and public health issues that came out of that terrible catastrophe. And so Congress passed in 2006 the Pandemic All Hazards Preparedness Act, affectionately known as PAPA, to basically mandate that HHS fulfill its obligations under the National Response Framework, which is how our government, our federal government, responds to support state, local, tribal, and territorial officials in the event of a declared emergency. HHS, Health and Human Services, is responsible for basically managing and leading emergency support function number eight, which is really about public health and healthcare services. From that mandate, the secretary has designated me the ASPR, the Assistant Secretary, to be that person who's in that leadership role to bring all of what HHS has under its roof and then all of which the federal government can offer to support state and local authorities in responding to medical and public health consequences of disasters or emergencies. So simply stated, our mission is to save lives and protect Americans from 21st century health threats. So what do you mean by 21st century health security threats? How are the threats of today different from what we've faced in the past? Certainly, I mean, obviously 9-11 was a watershed moment in American history where terrorism arrived on the homeland. And clearly that was recognized as one of the things that was very different from historically we had to deal with. But even significantly, things like Hurricane Katrina have not become outliers anymore. They've become standard events, these extreme climactic events. So in addition to those kinds of things, and for example, the wildfires in California, as well as the hurricanes that we're experiencing now, there's also this idea that there's re-emerging threats from nation state actors. Obviously, events in, in Iran here in Saudi Arabia raises that risk, as well as North Korea, and even with our peer competition with Russia and China. So there is an incredible risk that we face as a country, and whether we look at it from terrorism to nation states, there are certain things that have developed, for example, cyber vulnerabilities and cybersecurity, for example, or something much more mundane but very critical to the healthcare industry is the supply chain for which many of our products that we use to treat our patients here in the United States are sourced outside the United States and oftentimes the raw materials and the active pharmaceutical ingredients are not manufactured or located here. So bad weather, bad actors, uh, even tariff wars can basically interrupt that supply chain and impact things that we need to do every day to take care of Americans. Can you talk a little bit about what HHS and ASPR have done to help the nation better prepare and respond to these new and increasingly complex threats? 
Certainly, we have our legacy programs that have laid a strong foundation, obviously, for your audience. Uh, the hospital preparedness program that was created after 9-11 is something that we continue today and evolve to refine it so it becomes continually relevant to the challenges at hand. We also have the program called the National Disaster Medical System, which is really a relationship that we have through memorandums of understanding with approximately 1,700, pardon me, 1,900 civilian hospitals across the country to assist in responding to disasters, either natural or events that would occur outside our borders to support Department of Defense. Significantly also have uh, the Biomedical Advanced Research Development Authority and the Strategic National Stockpile. That represents uh, under one roof, under ASPR's roof, the ability to not only develop and acquire countermeasures for a broad range of things that range from pandemic influenza to emerging infectious diseases like Ebola, but also chemical, biological, and radiological and nuclear threats. And then the last thing I'll just mention for this audience is the Medical Reserve Corps, which is approximately 180,000 Americans, many of whom have advanced uh, medical and public health degrees, who are available to volunteer in the case of disasters or crisis where they can assist state and local authorities to manage those events better. So that's what we've done historically, and now we're working on some new ideas as it relates to some very specific threats. So one that's well established and some of you already know about is the regional treatment network for Ebola and other special pathogens. Uh, we've invested mightily to basically create centers of excellence across the country and regional uh, centers to manage potential or suspect cases of highly infectious diseases like Ebola. Mm -hmm. Obviously, in today's world where we're having a very uh, significant outbreak of Ebola in the Democratic Republic of Congo, that only makes that kind of investment more relevant and meaningful today. We're also taking kind of a, a page from that experience and focusing on what we can do to develop better regional disaster health response systems. So this would be the merger between what I would call the hospital preparedness program and what we learned from the regional treatment network for Ebola and other special pathogens. It's this idea that we can create in a regional basis centers that are expert in dealing with burns, with highly infectious diseases, with pediatric trauma and emergencies, as well as potentially uh, radiological and nuclear events. And so that way we can again bolster the ability of our country in a decentralized way, taking advantage of the exquisite capabilities and care in the private sector and organizing them a little bit better and su certainly supporting them where we can with additional funds. The last thing I'll mention, because we'll probably be ro rolling this out in the next couple of weeks, is our National Disaster Pediatric Initiative, which is a, just another manifestation of this intent to really focus on how can we ensure that in any given day, any American who has an event or any child in America who has a traumatic event or an emergency event can get the best care of treatment no matter where they live in America. And that's what we're trying to do with this. The final phase of this uh, effort, I would say, is really revitalizing what has historically been the National Disaster Medical System, which has been a consortium of not only private sector hospitals, but the Veterans Affairs Department and the Department of Defense. And how can we basically ensure that if there were to be some kind of catastrophic event from an earthquake or terrible wildfires or even a nation state event or terrorist event, that there's enough expertise regionally to basically manage the potential trauma, burns, infectious diseases, as well as critical care that may be uh, caused by that. And so that's kind of in a very short synopsis, all the things we're trying to do, and it is a lot. So what are some of the biggest barriers to making sure the healthcare system is ready? Well, it's not a barrier. What I'd say, it's just the reality. The principal capabilities in our healthcare system don't reside at the federal level or under our control. They really reside in the private and public sector. And it's really about uh, not creating barriers, but overcoming the communication issues and basically addressing how can we be better partners with the private sector to advance this cause and building that public-private partnership to ensure that the healthcare system will always be always there to meet the needs of the public. And this requires, in some ways, a better investment from our part, but also a complementary private sector commitment for readiness on the part of the healthcare system. Can you describe some specific efforts underway to help develop a public private partnership and what the challenges are in getting hospitals to be more involved in this effort? 
I, I think probably the most important thing that we as the federal government can do is learn more from the private sector. So we've been holding a number of sessions at the National Academy of Sciences where we've enlisted the involvement of some representatives of the private health care sector to basically come and talk to us and tell us what does it mean to be a private health care sector in today's world, given all the pressures that you face or your community faces in terms of the costs of health care, trying to minimize those costs, the regulations that you have to live with, and quite frankly, the competition that exists within the healthcare system today. So we've been trying to understand better what are the motivators and the incentives that exist in the healthcare system today, and what would be things that would matter to the healthcare system to be more part of the conversation? How do we become more ready? It is our belief that there are some things we've already done, some things we've done with CMS, some things that we've done with the national academies, but quite frankly, there is no silver bullet to fix this. We are trying to turn an aircraft carrier around, and we need to be strategic patient, and most importantly, is listen to the healthcare community to understand what could work and what will work together, working with us, to basically achieve what I think are mutual goals for better preparedness. Let's drill down a little bit deeper on the whole subject of public-private partnerships for a minute, specifically talking about the role of insurers. Should the main public insurers, and I mean Medicaid and Medicare, as well as private sector insurers, should they be committing to coverage and payment policies that encourage healthcare systems to invest in their readiness? I think the thing is we believe that that in the end point will be something that would be very helpful because if we look at other parts of the healthcare system and looking at the quality of care and value that is often used in the context of other sectors of our everyday routine healthcare, they're very relevant to emergency healthcare. And, and quite frankly, there are new initiatives in our uh, innovation part of CMS that are looking at that in terms of how EMS, the emergency medical services, could be used in a more proactive way to avoid patients being brought to hospitals, to be treated in their communities and, and basically get care and how we can do that. That's, that's an experiment, a pilot that is beginning. And so I think that's an area that we believe is an area that we need to advance and quite frankly could be an area that we could include under the, the everyday considerations of better care and more value for care if we were to use it in the case of emergencies. What is your sense of where healthcare executives are right now? Are they open to increasing their readiness posture? Well, it's interesting in the conversations that we've had both in the, in the settings of the National Academies and individually, what we're finding is, is that, as you can imagine, with, with any kind of activity, business or otherwise, you always worry about continuity of operations. And so we know that for hospitals and healthcare systems, they're very concerned about that as it would relate to potentially natural events like hurricanes. And that's where we've probably had the most experience, unfortunately, but also learned a lot that many healthcare systems that are operating in these areas that are prone to climactic events are adjusting their practices to address what could be impacts of extreme climactic events, as well as other events that could potentially impact their ability to provide not only services to their communities, but also maintain the, com the continuity of their operations and, quite frankly, their business side of the house. So we believe that there's uh, an opportunity to advance this. We know that the 2017 CMS Emergency Preparedness Rule kind of began that dialogue for which executives could kind of work with us and talk with us about this that requires adequate planning for both natural and man-made events mm -hmm. and that there's a requirement for coordinating with federal, state, tribal, and regional and local emergency preparedness systems. So we believe that's the opening around here. As with anything, this is going to be something that we're going to learn together, work together, and accomplish together to do this. Really, we believe that in, uh, in the situation of community and population health requires prevention and efficient management for chronic diseases, but also means that they need to be ready to meet the needs of the public when the unexpected happens. And regrettably, it seems like unexpected things are happening with more frequency. Mm -hmm. And it really, I think, has gotten the attention of CEOs in the healthcare community. And it certainly has gotten the attention of uh, civic leaders around the country, governors, and certainly uh, people here in Washington, in Congress, and in the executive branch. So I think the time is ripe to continue these conversations. Whenever you start a journey, the first step is always the hardest. But with any journey, we know that every step of the way, if we can be good partners with our healthcare 
private sector and work with them and listen to them and understand what their needs are and what we can do to help work with them to basically identify common objectives to advance these preparedness goals that will will achieve the destination we're looking for, which is how do we provide better care for Americans no matter what the circumstance or contingency. So what can interested hospitals and health systems do to get more involved in this issue? I think part of this is committing into the dialogue that we've started. I think what we started at the National Academies is just the opening round of what will be a larger set of conversations, and no doubt uh, the American Hospital Association will figure prominently in that calculus as we kind of move this forward. We do want to find a way that, in some ways, for the private sector to innovate and, and regulate themselves with a clear sense they have a very special trust relation with the public at large. We're not trying to make this onerous in the sense of what will be mandated by Congress or by the executive branch, but more what is what makes good sense, mm-hmm. good business, and really what is what really is our obligation for our citizens to provide them the capabilities they need. God forbid they ever need something of this extreme nature. So, is there anything else that you'd like to share with our listeners that we haven't covered already today in this conversation? Well, I would just like to convey to you that um, in the National Academies process that we've undertaken already and have had a number of public meetings. We have distilled down what are a far-ranging number of different ideas from different professional groups, doctors, hospital associations, uh, private citizens, on the kinds of things, the incentives, that would make sense to basically work together with the private sector to basically advance. Some of these would be under potentially congressionally enabling kind of legislation. Some of it would be kind of CMS-related potential uh, relief and in, in some of the things we could do, and some of it could be even direct investments. The one unique thing about this enterprise that we've engaged on, it's just not HHS, it's also VA and, and Department of Defense. And realize they have their, if you want to call it, tentacles out into the private sector through the TRICARE system, for example. Mm-hmm. Uh, DOD utilizes uh, many healthcare systems around the nation to provide care for dependents and retirees. Obviously, the Veterans Affairs Department does something very similar. And so what we're trying to do is bring coherency and comprehensiveness to these sets of issues so that when we talk about the issues of preparedness, it's just not limited to HHS alone. Mm -hmm. It's with our DOD colleagues, our VA colleagues, as well as, most importantly, with the participating private sector healthcare systems that are involved. So we believe that in, at the end state, when we kind of do our next meeting in October, that we'll be able to provide to this community, the American Hospital Association, and anyone else who's interested, what, are the, what we see as the potential drivers and look for the feedback that would help us understand whether we're going in the right direction or maybe the wrong direction, or things that we could do to refine it in a way that would not only make sense, but I think benefit everyone. I always have this sense of urgency. Uh, It may not just be because I have my own personal clock ticking uh, in my current capacity, but I also know that we've been very, um, how should I say it, politely bad (laughs) at uh, predicting when the next crisis happens or disaster happens. And so I see there's an immediacy to move on with this and do things that can substantively and practically change our ability to help Americans in need when that happens, whenever it happens. Planning effective responses to the expanding array of potential disasters or emergencies is a huge challenge. Dr. Kadlik believes that by working in tandem and coordinating closely, hospitals and health systems and the federal government are up to the task. This has been Advancing Health, a podcast from the American Hospital Association. Thanks for listening.